hopefully that's okay with everyone. So again, welcome and uh, hopefully you'll get some great strategies here today that you can use in your classrooms, either virtual or in person. Um, but we're also gonna talk about engagement in a way that might be a little bit differently than what you're used to. We're gonna talk about student engagement in ways that look at the campus as a whole. We're gonna be looking at different student populations. So this is the session description so that you all know what you signed up for. We're gonna look at some research-based best practices. We're gonna look at diverse student populations. We're gonna look at student engagement in multiple modalities. And hopefully you will be able to walk away being able to implement some strategies right away. Um, what you're going to notice is as we're going through uh, the session, I'm going to be kind of stepping back, putting on my metacognitive hat and explaining to you some of the things that we're engaging in that are hopefully modeling for you engagement strategies. Some of these strategies you've probably seen and maybe even used yourselves. And hopefully you'll also walk away with some new ideas and some new ways of thinking and approaching student engagement. So this is our agenda. Um, we're going to start with something that is going to tap into our social emotional learning. We're going to do a time in. Then we're going to talk about andragogy. Say that five times fast. And then we're going to dive into some specific classroom uh, strategies that will hopefully inspire your students to participate and be active learners. And then we will wrap up with considerations for diverse student groups. Questions about the agenda? Awesome. All right, so not all of these strategies and everything that you're going to see did not just come from me. <laughs> I called upon a lot of folks who are experts in the field. So some of the main resources that I used um, to bring this information to you this afternoon, Student Engagement in Higher Education by Quay Harper and Parker. Also Student Engagement Techniques, a handbook for college faculty by Barclay. And then Barclay also co-authored this book called Interactive Lecturing. So I highly recommend all three of these um, textbooks are amazing resources and wealth of information. They're all very current and they all also um, address the online factor because we do know that there are challenges when you're transitioning classes from face to face to online. And, you know, we struggle sometimes with having our students engaged in person, but we have a new set of challenges when we are online and our students are in different scenarios and different situations and we have you know, a screen dividing us. And so these are great resources that, that also address that virtual aspect of student engagement. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is a time in. So Nearpod is a, um, a tool, a virtual tool that you can use to engage your students. And what I like about Nearpod is that it's interactive and there are a lot of embedded, um, lessons that are already there for you. So this one we're gonna to do together. Um, I didn't have to create it, it was already there. So what we're going to do is I'm going to share with you um, some information that's gonna help you to get into Nearpod. And then you will also be able to participate in the activity. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to put something in the chat and you can either go to nearpod.com or I'm going to put the link in the chat. So there's a link in the chat. If you go to that link right below the link, you're going to see that there is a code TPY3W. You're going to put that code in. And then I will tell you in just a moment how to access it. So hopefully you can see my screen. So this is the code again, much bigger. You can click on the link that I put in the chat 
and then you can put in the code TPY3W. Is everyone able to get to the Nearpod link from the link put in the chat? So when I went to the link, it told me to put my name. So I just put yes. my name. Thank you for that. And then, but, but and then, then after that, I'm like uh, in the encouragement, warm up, empathy. Yes. Yeah, so it's it like this. Okay. Okay. So yes, you I see exactly. put your name in. And uh, Bernice, I saw your hand was up. Did you have a question? Wasn't asking me for the code. What Leslie just said is what I got. I put my first name. Yes. And I yes. Again, and I I'm trying to figure out on your screen or my screen here's my screen so i got unlocked content so where does the code go so if you've already put in your name then you probably didn't need the code yeah we didn't need that's, it that was the code okay you. so yeah. the code would be if you went to joinnearpod.com and then you would need the code but if you went to the the link directly then you're already in I clicked on your link and that was it yeah okay so if you put in your name and then we're going to go to the next part. Okay, so to engage our students, we need to we need to think about the whole student, especially when we think about these difficult times, right? Um, taking the time to foster social emotional learning can be beneficial to our students. And we heard from if you were in the, the student perspectives panel this morning, I think that that really rang true in a lot of the um, a lot of the stories that students were sharing about how they were connecting or not connecting with professors and how they were made to feel like their instructors cared about them. Okay, so this is a warm up activity. Um, warm up activities help to build routines and create a comfortable learning environment. I teach child development and education, as I said, and one of the things that I tell my students, my philosophy is grounded in this statement, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And as corny and touchy-feely touchy as it may sound, it really is true. You know, whatever content knowledge I have, or if I'm an expert in my field, ultimately students just want to feel like they matter and that you care about them and what they're going through. All right, so I see all of you are there waiting. So this is your task and you are gonna have an opportunity to draw it. So I'm gonna hide names so that you don't feel self-conscious about your drawing. You're gonna draw a picture or write something to encourage someone or brighten their day. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see some tools. You can click on um, the pen tool. You can click on, if you wanna upload a photo, you can click on the little square. So just something you can, you can brighten your own day. You can look in um, our Zoom session and you can send a message to someone to brighten their day or just something that you think is encouraging, that's positive. And you're just gonna go ahead and put that on your template there. I'm seeing some amazing drawings happening. Not sure I understand what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm still open. You can hear me. Who am I drawing this? I, I can see. Oh, I'm it's up to you. You can. It can be just a drawing to encourage anyone in sure. our session today. It can be something that you would say or or that would that would symbolize how you would encourage one of your students. We're not selecting someone to send a message to, is that what you're- No, no, we're just going through kind of a simulation of getting that and getting that picture or that encouragement out there. So right now it's just being shared with our whole group. It's not going to anyone specific. Okay, so now once I've drawn it, what happens? I, I have to hit submit, is that it? Okay. Click submit, if you're done. If you're okay, done with it, if you're still working on it, then that's okay too. That, your answer has been submitted. Wonderful. So if you can all see my screen, you can see all of these amazing drawings materialize. Can you all see the screen? Yes. This one is hilarious. The Zoom meeting <laughs> before and after Yorkie and then the wonderful rainbows. I see some of you incorporated flowers and high fives. Have a great day. Hearts. Give it about another 10 seconds. Don't worry if you don't finish. All right. So those things where it says have a great day, is that something I can't read? I'm looking at your screen right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. This one right here. 
Oh, but that person wrote it. Okay, I thought it was something. Yeah. Okay, got it, got it. Somebody wrote it and I see some folks uploaded photos, which is great. Where do you write the message? So there should be a virtual screen. So if you click at the bottom and you see that there is a, like a writing tool icon, if you yeah. click on that and then you click on your screen with your cursor, you should see a little box when you logged into Nearpod. Are you seeing that? Um, <laughs> I see an arrow, I see a crayon, I see uh -huh. a marker. Exactly, and right above those check. tools, mm -hmm. right above those tools, you should see a white box, almost like a blank canvas. Like a trash can? No. No, oh, it should be right above. Black, oh, way up. Next to a trash can? I'm not it sure. Enter your text? Yes. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. Got it. Okay. So I think we get the idea. This is a way that students can, and again, this is just one of hundreds and hundreds of lessons on Nearpod that um, I've used with students. We did one where it was a meditation, where it walked them through a meditation. Um, we did one that that emphasized gratitude. It was a gratitude jar and they would draw something in the gratitude jar. And the social emotional learning aspect is just one part of Nearpod. Nearpod can have lessons in any content area, any discipline. So this is just one example that I wanted to share. And so Again, this is a self-contained activity and then it gives students some background about empathy and why when you encourage others, you think about what they're going through and you try to help them You show empathy and compassion. All right, so I mean, thank you. Yeah, for I have a quick question. Yes, absolutely. Just really quickly, um, I'm wondering if students could eventually see what other students have written because I can only see like, you're done but I can't see what anyone else has done unless they're like, unless you're sharing your screen. Is that how students would see the images? Yes, that's a great okay. question. So you're asking if, if we were independent of Zoom with being controlling it, would students be able to see what other students have written? Mm -hmm. um, I believe so. I believe that they would have to be um, connected to me because I'm the person who is who created the lesson in order okay. to be able to see it. But I'll let me double check and get back to you on that because I'm not sure, but that would be a great tool that students would be able to come back to it and see, see it later. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay, so. I want to talk a little bit about how student engagement relates to other topics because student engagement is a fairly broad topic. Um, and you'll find that it's an umbrella under which a lot of other approaches reside. So you're going to hear a lot of overlap. So for example, CRTL, culturally responsive teaching and learning. Pedagogy is a term that we hear a lot. Andragogy, you might have heard, we'll talk about that. Humanizing learning, we've had lots of workshops on how do we humanize our classes. Uh, equitable instructional practices, either online or otherwise. Trauma-informed care. Information processing, which is something that I talk to my students a lot about. How does the brain process information? How do you take information from your short-term short memory to your work? working memory to your long-term memory. And so a lot of these different elements tie into student engagement. So I just wanted us to kind of have a visual or just kind of think about how a lot of these concepts are connected and there's a lot of overlap. All right, so student engagement, what is it really? So here are some quotes that I've taken. Um, again, there's a lot of research on student engagement it can mean different things in different contexts. Um, and it's definitely not one size fits all. But today we're gonna to be focusing on uh, student engagement as it relates to higher education. So here's one quote that I wanted to pull out. In education, student engagement refers to the degree of attention, curiosity, interest, optimism, and passion that students show when they are learning or being taught. 
which extends to the level of motivation they have to learn and pro progress in their education. Another idea to consider, research has demonstrated that engaging students in the learning process increases their attention and focus, motivates them to practice higher level critical thinking skills and promotes meaningful learning experiences. Meaningful student involvement through the learning environment, whether that's in person or virtual, it might look different. And something else to keep in mind, participation is not the same as engagement. Just because students are participating and submitting work does not necessarily mean that they're engaged. They must talk about what they are learning, write about it, relate it to past experiences and apply it to their daily lives. So these are some thoughts about what student engagement is. Okay, so now I want to turn it to you all to reflect a bit um, and think about what engages you when you are participating in a learning experience. So what we're gonna do is we're going to do what's called a chat waterfall. So I want you to think about your response to this question what engages you when you are participating in a learning experience? And you're gonna type it into the chat, but you're not going to hit enter until I give you the signal. And so the purpose of doing the activity this way, waterfall of chat, is sometimes when students are asked a question, sometimes they are going to respond the way that their classmates respond, right? Group think. So we want to discourage group thing. We, we don't want students to say, okay, well, I saw everyone write this, so I'm gonna just go with the flow. I'm going to um, write what everyone has written. Also, when students are responding to the chat at different times, students are distracted because they're trying to read what's in the chat and they're not focusing on their own response. So by collectively saying, okay, we're all gonna take a moment, we're gonna reflect, we're gonna write our response. And then when I say enter, everyone's gonna hit enter and then we're gonna see a waterfall of responses. And then we can take a few moments to review all of the responses at once. Does that sound okay? So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to think about and type into the chat your response to this question. What engages you when you are participating in a learning experience? Just don't hit enter with your text just yet. So go ahead and think about it and write it into the chat. Okay, about 10 more seconds. All right, is everyone ready? On the count of three, I'm gonna say one, two, three, enter, and then you're gonna hit enter, and then we're gonna see everyone's responses. Ready? One, two, three, enter. <laughs> Very cool. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the responses. Thank you, everyone. So I'm engaged in a learning experience when I get to work with others. Let me do the work a bit. After your example, this is what makes me engage. Safe environment, respect of others, interesting material and subject matter. I'm kind of moving going up in the chat. I have some prior knowledge or exposure to the presentation or if it's beautiful or unexpected writing notes by hand and annotating, read, annotating readings by hand, also taking short quizzes if available, activities within lectures like anonymous surveys or a quiz, great. These are really um, telling and enlightening. Process time and action. How engaging, passionate the instructor is and if the information is well and thoughtfully organized. Awesome. So, we're all adult learners in here as our students are. And so a lot of the things that you're saying engage you when you're participating in a learning experience are in fact, a lot of the same things that engage your students as well. Any thoughts or comments or questions so far um, 
about things that you associate with student engagement? I really like just these two examples that you've given us that I can easily do in my class next week. Um, So thanks for sharing, Marini. Sure, awesome. Okay, so (laughs) something else that helps to enhance student engagement is what we call activating prior knowledge or sometimes we call it Uh, background intro probe, right? So we wanna see what it is that our students are already bringing to the table. Um, When we use prior knowledge, it helps us to build new knowledge and apply critical thinking. Um, And also because active learning requires students to integrate new learning into what they already know, it's helpful to have students participate in activities that focus or ask them to focus on what they've recently learned. Okay, so these are a couple of questions. I'm gonna put you in breakouts in in just a few moments and you are going to reflect on times that you knew your students were engaged. So on the last slide, we were talking about ourselves and how we feel most engaged. And so now we're gonna shift and kind of um, think about it through the lens of our students. So reflect on times that you knew your students were engaged. How did it feel? How did it feel for you to know that your students were engaged? What conditions do you think contributed to to what made your students engaged? Okay, so we're going to um, go into breakouts in just a moment and then you'll have a Jamboard where you will write your responses to the first reflection question on one Jamboard page. And then we're going to go to a different Jamboard page where you will you will reflect on the second question, which is kind of the flip side, right? We don't want to, we don't want to necessarily reflect on this, but that's how we get better. So we're going to reflect on times that we knew our students were not engaged. How did it feel? What conditions do you think contributed to what made your students disengaged? Or you can look at it a different way. What conditions prevented engagement? Okay. So something like this this person in here. 1930 the republican controlled house of representatives in an effort to alleviate the effects of the anyone anyone the great depression passed the anyone anyone a tariff bill the holly smoot tariff act which anyone raised or lowered raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? I don't know if you've ever had students look at you like that, (laughs) but um, that's definitely a, a sign that they're not engaged. What do you think? And I know that this is this is satire, you know, this is comical, or maybe not, maybe it's reality in some cases. This is from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, for those of you who maybe don't recall this iconic movie from the 80s. Um, What is it about this instructor that you think made the students disengaged? What are some of the obvious things? Go ahead and add Is monotony. Monotony, yes, the drone, the voice of just no inflection, right? He seems like not super engaged. Exactly. That's something that someone put in the chat, that if you're enthusiastic about the topic, and that's something that we talk about in child development, you know, you have to channel the emotion and the motivation because your students are looking to you. If you look bored, well, why are they going to be interested, right? Bernice, I see your hand up. Yeah, so the, to me, it looked like that is I haven't got a clue. For, forget about how entertaining the, the person speaking is. The guy's looking like, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And that brings up a whole different level of how to engage students because there is this thing called background knowledge and not everybody has that background knowledge. So you can ask for background knowledge, but it may not be there to ask for. So that's what I see when I look at this guy. Absolutely. Action to the content. I don't think it's got a, anything to do with the guy that's, I I understand the point of the movie and stuff, but my point is, it's not always so obvious that it's really the person, but rather 
the content that isn't resonating because there's no connection to it. Absolutely. I always say that you have to use what students know to build on what they don't know. So if students don't understand about the Smoot Act and the tariffs, then you have to try to find a way to connect it to something that they understand so that they're going to be engaged, right? Because obviously students come with prior knowledge, right? But you're teaching them something new, right? That's why we're in this role as the quote unquote expert. We're bringing something new and we're trying to integrate that to our students' schema, what they already know. But you're right, if they have no connection to what he's talking about, then I'm typing into the chat my response so a little bit different than the one you gave. Awesome. And then I saw another hand. Someone else had their hand up. Yeah, it was me. Hi. Hi. You know what? This um this reminded me of the whole um sage on the stage versus guide on the side thing. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what comes to mind because he's just talking. He could be saying anything. <laughs> they are just not even really hearing him. It's more noise you know <laughs> it's just noise so it's just noise sorry about that it's just yeah. noise and the teacher's sense of self-awareness seems to be lacking right right um, yes it's pretty clear that the students are not following and the teacher's kind of teaching to himself I see another hand Laura oh I was just gonna say early on I noted this this brought up like an experience I had early on in teaching where um I realized that if I didn't in actually engage them, like he's not interested, he's like anyone, anyone, but like he doesn't actually want to hear from them. At least that's not what he's conveying. So, so I think a curiosity about their lives and their input is crucial, you know? So like early on, I would throw, I'd always do an introduction or something so that people could actually contribute something. So it felt like a a group versus me like blah, 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 blah. Because when I did the blah, 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 even if I tried to make it engaging, it, it, I was starting to get the, the glassy eyes. Thank you, such a great point. Yes, if you look at the teacher, listen to the teacher, he's not giving any wait time. And that's something that we learn about in education that wait time is like 0.2 seconds oftentimes when teachers ask a question because half the time we don't necessarily want students to ask questions we want to keep the lesson moving right and then students from the students perspective they're thinking well if i ask a question then that's going to show that i don't know what's going on i'm not paying attention and teachers don't necessarily want a lot of questions because then that lets them know that the students don't understand what's going on. And that's a, that's difficult, right? So we have to kind of retrain ourselves to be comfortable sitting in the silence for a few moments and give, you know, even five seconds is a lot longer wait time than we often see instructors give. Five seconds might seem like a long time when it's silent, but that's a very short amount of time for a student to process the question and think about their response. I think I might have saw one other hand up. Was there someone else who wanted to share a comment? Okay, so we are going to get into breakout groups. And then I'm going to put into the chat um, the link for the Jamboard where you will write your responses to the two questions. So into the chat is the Jamboard. Okay, and then I'm gonna put you in groups. Let's see, we have 25. So I'll put you in six groups of about four. Sorry, I know that square is probably in, in the way. Okay. Okay, so what questions do you have before we go into the breakout? So you are going to see um, a Jamboard when you click on the link, and you're only going to answer the first two pages. The first question is going to ask you to reflect on times you knew your students were engaged, and then the second page is going to ask you to reflect on times you knew your students were not engaged. The third page, don't worry about it for now, we'll come to that later. So what questions do you have about what we're going to do for about the next five minutes? 
Are we doing this in, sorry, you said we're doing this in breakout rooms? Yes, I'm going to open okay. up the rooms and there will be about three to four participants per room. So you're going to talk about these questions and then you're going to collectively, you know, mm -hmm. discuss and then you're going to capture your thoughts onto the Jamboard. Got it. Since there's more than one page and I only see one page, how do you navigate to the next page? So if you go to the very top, you'll see a number with an arrow and the arrow, if you click on the little arrow, it'll take you to page two. Uh, but you don't want us to save the, the sticky notes now? Yes, you, you are going to use the sticky notes or you can write, you can use text to write on the Jamboard. Um, is anyone not familiar with Jamboard and need me to show them how, how it works? I know that we've been doing Jamboard a bit this week so far. Um, I'm not. Sense. Yes, please. Sure. Okay. So let me do a new share. Okay. So when you click on the link, you should see something that looks like this. Does everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I see someone's already written their response here. So if you wanna use a sticky note, you're gonna click on this little square with the lines on it and you click on it and you'll get a pop-up. You type in what you wanna say, you can change the colors and then you're gonna click save. I'm not gonna click save, but you would click save and then you can even move it around, okay? And if you want to, Use a pen. Let's say somebody wrote something that really resonated with you and you wanna circle it because you're like, wow, that's awesome. I'm gonna erase that. So all the tools are there on the left navigation pane. That Could you, you show, me, show me again the save, please? Yeah, sure. So when you want the post-it, you're gonna click, if you wanna use ah. the post-it option, click on the sticky note. And then when that comes up, once you start writing something, then the Got save it. option should pop up. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. And then the page numbers right up here. So we're page one. That's for question number one. And then when you click the right arrow, it's going to take you to page two. And this is students not being engaged. Don't worry about going to page three. That's something that we're going to do later on. Okay, so we're just focusing on um, page one and page two. I'm going to put you in your groups. You'll be in your groups for about five minutes. Does that sound good? What other questions might there be? Okay, I'll see you in five minutes. You should see invitations to go into your rooms. Oh, I have a few people I need to put into rooms who aren't yet assigned. Okay, Mark is going to a room now. Let's see. Did everyone get their invitation? I see two of you still here. Are you able to go into your breakout rooms? M. Gagrad and Nilalu L.
We can't hear you. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look. I think everyone's back now. Let's take a look at some of the responses that we had for the first question, reflecting on times you knew your students were engaged. Lots of responses here. At the lecture is before an exam, students are more attentive. Teaching something that students can relate to. So, you know, sometimes this lends itself more easily to certain um, to certain disciplines than others. So if it's something that maybe students are taking as a GE and it's not something that they're inherently interested in, we have to find ways to make it relatable. Multiple means of representation. When I tell personal stories about disorders or diseases I teach about, I'm sure that is very fascinating and intriguing for students. Using real life experiences and applications, the time of day, that's interesting. So what do we find about the time of day? Are, are students typically more engaged in the earlier classes or are they more engaged in the evening classes? What do you all find? Morning classes. <laughs> More engaged in morning classes. Yeah, they, and especially on a Friday afternoon, people want to go home and that's what they're thinking about. Absolutely. <laughs> or if they go to work afterwards, you know, after four or five o'clock, they have a part-time job. Absolutely. Well, I, I actually- It really depends. Oh, sorry. It uh, really depends on the class cohort. Yeah. Some class are like very interactive and over classes and I, and I don't know why. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that I taught some night classes that were very engaged and they're very motivated. Uh, often they come after a day of work, but because they really are interested, you know, in the subject or in the, you know, it's part of their pathway and the goal of getting to a specific uh, career, uh, they're very engaged. Most of the time uh, I teach in the evening and most of my classes at the evening, as Borette said, I agree with her and they come really engaged in the classroom, what's happened to them. Even they share with the class and classmate, with the instructor, they are really engaged in the evening class. Those are great points, two different ends of the spectrum, right? Sometimes yeah. students are highly engaged in the evening classes. You brought yeah. up some very good points. I think maybe we should, you know, the GE, if you if they take the class that is not their major, then, you know, maybe they're less engaged if it's in the mm -hmm. evening, but if it's a class that is part of what they really want to do, then it's completely different kind of like uh, attitude to begin with. Absolutely. Great points. So we have a lot of great examples here for times that we knew our students were engaged. So let's look at when we knew our students were not engaged, when you see their mobile phones, right? So some, some ways to combat that, use technology in the classroom. Um, that's something that I've used before. So when you're doing like something interactive, like a poll, I've used Kahoot or poll everywhere in my classes to poll my students and they have to use their devices. Um, what are some other ways that you have, any of you in here maybe have, have any sorts of policies or things that you do to mitigate the distraction of mobile phones or to use mobile phones to your advantage. Any ideas anyone want to share? Just go ahead and unmute and share. Um, I, hi, I'm Elena. Um, I teach um, Spanish. So what I do is I have students look up words like, how do you say you know, for um, whatever, pencil in Spanish. And I'm like, use your phone or I'll ask somebody else like, who has their phone up? Out and, um, and I'll ask them to look it up or, um, or look up different contexts of a word. Like, I don't know, like, oh, like the word um, can, like has multiple meanings in Spanish. And so I'll ask them to give me, like I'll ask one person to look up one definition, I'll ask the second person to to do a set to do the second definition um, um, or lo to look up at a funny picture and then um, and then write about it things like that so I use I'm, I'm not I'm not against the phone being in the classroom but I, I do use it to my advantage right yep those are, those are some great examples oh. I see dead eyes deafening silence depressing yes it can be very very unnerving in in person or on Zoom, 
when all you see are little little black boxes and, and no one's engaging. So hopefully, you know, we can brainstorm and you'll get some tools on how to avoid that. Um, no one, no answer when a question is asked. Yes, it can feel personal. Absolutely. It's hard to not take it personally when you are, you know, what you perceive to be giving your, your heart and soul to, you know, coming up with the lesson and your students just aren't feeling it. Right. So we have to think of ways to engage students. And we're going to talk about a lot of those strategies in just a moment. So hopefully we can build our toolkit of different things that we can do. And we are all really, really great resources for one another. Uh, running out of time and going too fast. Those are definitely things that I struggle with. Um, and that can limit engagement. If you're going too quickly, students don't have time to really discuss. They don't have time to let the information sink in. They don't have time to kind of grapple with the information if you're moving too quickly. And also it makes students shut down when you're like, oh, we have so much to cover. I'm gonna go through this quickly. How many times have we had to say that? I have all of this to cover. And then students might say, okay, information overload. I'm mm -hmm. just gonna shut down because I'm not going to be able to retain all of this information. I'll just look over the notes after class. So for now, I'm just gonna tune out. I've definitely been there myself in classes before. Okay, thank you all for sharing. Um, some of you have asked about the Jamboard and Jamboard is a tool that is part of Google, the Google suite. So if you are familiar with using Google Docs or a Google Sheets or a Google Drive, um, Jamboard is one of those features. You just scroll down, you know, in your toolbar when you open it up and it's a yellow icon, it looks like a J and you can use the Jamboard and it's pretty intuitive, I feel. And it's a nice way to, um, kind of maintain collaboration and you can always go back to it. It can be something organic that your students can create together. And it's, it's always, it's an artifact that you can keep referring back to. So it's, it's a pretty nice tool. And there's other similar tools. You can do a Padlet. Um, there's a laugher that some of you maybe have used as well. So let's take a moment to discuss adult learning. Um, specifically, the research suggests that engagement strategies for adult learners differ from the way that children learn. Um, these might be some things to consider when you are developing your curriculum or your lesson. So Malcolm Knowles, he's attributed to kind of coining this idea, uh, this theory of andrago andragogy. And it's a, an attempt to develop a theory specifically for a, adult learning. And in practical terms, it means that instruction for adults needs to focus more on the process and less on the content being taught. And there are six principles. Uh, adults need to know why they need to learn something. They need to build on their experience. They need to feel responsible for their learning. Um, importantly, adults are ready to learn if training solves an immediate problem. Adults want their training to be problem focused and adults learn best when motivation comes intrinsic intrinsically. And over here is kind of a comparison between pedagogy versus andragogy. So you see pedagogy is more child focused, it's more teacher directed. Um, the teacher is the one who sets the objectives. Students are more extrinsically motivated. It's less autonomous. Um, and the curricula is preconceived. And andragogy is kind of on the other side where it's more adult self-directed. Uh, it's criterion versus norm reference. It's more collaborative. It's more informal. It's more autonomous. It's a teacher-student partnership and learning is relevant to the real world. But I will say in my experience, having come from K-12 before higher ed, there's a lot of overlap here because what we consider best practices in K-12 pulls from a lot of what you see here in the andragogy side. And these are things that we in higher ed have taken um, because K-12 has been doing it for so long, make, meaning that um, teacher-directed teaching in K-12 is not something that, um, has been looked at favorably for, for a while now. So if you're going through um, teacher education uh, programs or you're not going to be, you're not going to be um, guided to be, as someone said earlier, the sage on the stage, the all-knowing teacher. You're going to be, um, you're going to be 
instructed to make sure that your teaching is student centered, that it is more collaborative, that you are more of a facilitator, the guide on the side, um, that it is more interactive, that you are trying to foster intrinsic motivation. You know, we want to foster growth mindset strategies in our K-12 students because we want them to have this more internal locus of control for why they're motivated to do something, not because they're going to have a pizza party at the end of the week. So I find that a lot of um, a lot of these characteristics for andragogy also kind of blur into the pedagogy realm too. But I did want to point out because there are distinctions in the literature between pedagogy and andragogy. And so I do want us to think about, you know, working with adult learners, what, how are we thinking about these principles when we're designing lessons and we're trying to get our students to connect and we're trying to make our students feel like what they're learning is relevant and valuable. And then it has, it serves a real purpose in their life because they're going to be inherently intrinsically motivated because they're trying to you know, pass the class, get a degree or transfer or for a career. And so there's this built-in intrinsic motivation. So these are some things to consider about um, what adult, adult learning looks like. So here are some strategies that I'll share with you. And again, these are strategies that I've learned from colleagues and that I've learned um, through going through a teacher credential program and things that I've just gleaned from, from the world today. And some of these might be things that you've used in your classes before. And I welcome you to please share anything that you're doing or if you've tried any of these, these things and you wanna share how they've worked or not worked, I welcome all of your input. So interactive lecturing is one thing that we can try to employ in our classroom. So there's this age old debate about um, lecturing versus active learning. Um, and oftentimes, especially in higher ed, lecturing is, is sometimes frowned upon. Um, it doesn't have to be either or, right? So there is there are many benefits to lecturing. And so active, interactive, lecturing kind of takes lecturing and active learning and integrates the two. So a method of integrating lecture and active learning. So what does an engaging presentation do? It should spark the learner's curiosity and then maintains the interest throughout. Because so oftentimes we might start strong and then it starts to fizzle out and you see those glazed over looks. Um, the uh, facilitator speaks with enthusiasm and expertise. The facilitator respects the learners uses language economically and effectively, shares content in a manner that is well organized and unfolds logically, proceeds at a comfortable pace, and concludes in a way that leaves listeners satisfied that their time listening was well spent, right? So students are, they're there, they're investing their time and their money, and they wanna feel like they're getting something valuable out of the time spent in your classroom. So here are some elements for engaging presentation. So have clear learning goals. Um, I remember observing a professor at another, uh, one of our sister colleges and something simple that she did that I love is that when she started the class, she would say, last class we did this. And she just simply kind of quickly reviewed what was covered last class. And then at the end of the class, she would say, and the next class we're going to do this. And I thought that was really simple, but really powerful because it showed cohesion. It, it primed students to know what they're connecting today's learning to and then what they're going to anticipate for the next class. Um, there's, and there's lots of ways that we can focus our classes online. Um, you can, you can um, include objectives at the beginning of modules. I know some of us have, have learned that in some of our Canvas best practices classes. One thing that I do with my students is oftentimes in our textbooks at the beginning of the chapters, we have like focus, um, focus point or objectives. And so I'll have my students, and this is part of information processing. What I tell my students is, I say, before you begin to read the chapter, go through those objectives at the beginning of the chapter and ask yourself, what do I already know about the topic? Because chances are you already are bringing some knowledge to the topic. When you start thinking about those objectives or those focus questions, you are activating your schema. It's kind of like, you know, what your brain already 
believes it knows about a topic. It's like a framework. And so I use this metaphor of a coat hanger. And I say, whenever you're activating your schema or you're thinking about what you already know about a topic, you have these coat hangers in your brain, these hooks in your brain. And so you're activating those hooks. And then as you go through the chapter, you're, you're learning new information. You might shift your thinking, right? You might learn something new and then you realize that you have to change your schema, but now you have something to hang on those hooks. So as you gather new information through the chapter, you might hang a coat onto one of those hooks. You might hang a hat onto one of those hooks. You might hang a belt onto one of those hooks. And that's the new information that you're adding to something that you already know. So it builds a foundation. And then after you read the chapter, you go back and you revisit those focus questions and you see what new learning have I acquired? What sort of um, confusions can I clarify? And so that's part of information processing where students are more likely to bring that information from their short-term memory into their working memory and hopefully into their long-term memory and they, they can retain that information. And then the format, presentations should be shorter in length. So we think about attention span, um, demonstration as you're demonstrating, your storytelling, some of you wrote that in the Jamba where you're telling personal stories and that's a great way to engage your students. Uh, performing, acting something out, using you know, animated movements, identify and communicate essential parts. Students really appreciate when you let them know these are key elements, these are important parts that you're going to need to know. Supports, the research shows that students do like having slides, though some studies show they don't necessarily improve learning. For example, the slides may be distracting or they may have superfluous information. So just be mindful when you use slides that you, know, you are including what's important and asking students for feedback. Um, I observed Bernice teaching a class recently and that's something that she did very transparently. She said, you know, I tried this new thing with the slides. What did you think about the way that it was organized? What did you think about the colors that I used? It was very specific. And so the students felt like they had a stock in how the information was presented. And Bernice, as the instructor, she demonstrated that her students' input was really valuable and important and that she was a reflective practitioner and was willing to make changes and adjust them based on what was going to benefit her students' learning process the best. Can I make one comment since you brought me up? Yes. Time becomes a factor. These are wonderful, wonderful strategies and you do them remarkably well. I shouldn't say remarkably, extremely well. Uh, and I've, I've been in the lower grades as well. And I have seen the, the leaders of those groups and you're certainly tops amongst those folks that become our leaders in the lower grades. But the time that we are allowed to spend in the environment that we're in at the college is not the same. And that creates a bit of a problem unless you can adjust somehow to get the work, everything done that needs to be done. But thank you for mentioning me, but I just wanted to make that point that more of that could be done if we can figure out a way to buy the time to do it. Absolutely. And again, Rainey is quite accomplished. I, I enjoy watching her a lot. <laughs> thank you. And I would say that all teachers, whether you're in K-12 or in higher ed are all probably saying the same thing that we struggle with time, not enough time. Right. And so it gets to the point where for me, I have to just understand that it's depth over breadth. Right. It's like, how deeply are we getting? How engaged are the students in the conversation? If we don't get through what was planned that day, if the students are going to remember what we discussed, if they're going to remember the experience that they had in the classroom, for me, that's more valuable than covering you know, all of the, the, the bullet points, because you can flip your classroom, you can put things on Canvas. You know, there's other ways that your students can engage outside of the classroom, but they can't build that relationship, you know, unless they are with you. So for me, it's, it's, um, it's an opportunity to just kind of let go and, and look at depth over breath. I see some hands up. So I think Lucy and then Laura. Um, one of the ways, I, I'm only asynchronous and online, um, but one of the ways that I get have gotten feedback is I put two videos, two, they're like one minute videos about like the art elements and I ask them to vote for one of them because I'll use it for the next class, even though I have been using it for the last two years, but you know, so they're comparing two different approaches. 
That's a great idea. And I'm sure students really appreciate that in real time, like what they say manifests into how they're going to receive the information in the next class. So I think that's a really great strategy. Laura. Um, I had a question about um, the under supports. It says lecture outlines and note taking frameworks are noted to improve student performance. And I was just wondering, is that lecture outlines that the instructor provides or is that lecture outlines that you encourage them to make? Or both. So this, this, I think it, I think it could be both, but in this case, it's referring more to the ones that the instructors make. Okay. So, for example, I know that Professor Cole would would create um, a template where she creates an outline for students that they can follow along during the lecture. So they're feeling they're filling in blanks for key concepts and terms. I mean, it's definitely extra work. <laughs> sure. But um, that would be something that the instructor would provide students so that they can anticipate. And it, it gives them a framework for, you know, how am I supposed to be following along in this lecture? What am I supposed to be looking at for important um, concepts? And then they can check their understanding of the material based on how they're able to complete those outlines. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you for that question. And then climate instructors can make an effort to establish a positive climate that contributes to student success. Communication, instructor caring, enthusiasm, and expressiveness are related to improvements in student learning. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Um, these come from films that you may have seen. Brief example, this one is from The Great Debaters. Now, of course, these are not perfect examples. They're movies and so they're gonna cater towards the dramatic, but I want to illustrate a point about caring, showing communication, expressiveness, um, is important when you're trying to capture your students. Have a seat. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and I eat well and I grow strong. Tomorrow I will sit at the table when company comes Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. Who wrote that? Langston Hughes, 1924. 1925. Hating you shall be a game played with cool hands. Memory will lay its hands upon your breast and you will understand my hatred. Gwendolyn Bennett wrote that. She was born in 1902, unofficially. You see, in most states, Negroes were denied birth certificates, which means I can lie about my age the rest of my life. <laughs> You think that's funny? <laughs> to be born without record. Mr. Reed, hand these on. I'm going to introduce you to some new voices this semester. There's a revolution going on in the North, in Harlem. They're changing the way Negroes in America think. I'm talking about poets like Hughes, Bennett, Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, some are teethed on a silver spoon with the stars strung up for a rattle. I cut my teeth as a black raccoon. For implements of battle. Meet me after class. All right, so not everyone can be Denzel in the classroom, but pretty powerful. And this one comes from um, crazy rich Asians. So these are both college classrooms. So let me show you this one. I'm all in. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> nothing? <laughs> this whole time you had nothing. All right, so how 
did I beat T.A. Curtis so very, very badly? Well, I know for a fact that Curtis is cheap. So he's not playing using logic or math, but using his psychology. Our brains so hate the idea of losing something that's valuable to us that we abandon all rational thought and make some really poor decisions. So Curtis wasn't playing to win. He was playing not to lose. Here, put it towards a haircut. All right, so I see a, a hand up, Corrine. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yes, so it, it's what I was actually saying in the in break room. Teaching is a bit like acting. Um, every time I, I'm about to start a class, I'm like, I feel like I'm going on the stage. <laughs> uh, and especially because I'm very shy. Normally, I'm very introvert. So it's really like, okay, I'm going in. Mm -hmm. um, however... Teaching with Zoom makes it very different because I actually don't have, I don't see the reactions of a student and we cannot use really our body language like they do. Um, so it's quite tricky. That's I it. That was yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's definitely challenging. So let's get to some strategies. Thank you for sharing that. And I think a lot of teachers no matter what grade, feel what you're feeling like. We have to kind of gear up ourselves. We have to build this momentum. My opinion, I think when you feel like uh, she mentioned shy, it's a sense of responsibility because we have a big response in our shoulder. Yep. We're gonna meet such as 30, 20, 40 students. All we have to give them, you. exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a sense of responsibility. <laughs> yes. And that's a big, big responsibility. A lot of pressure. That's why we feel that, as she said, I have been teaching more than 24 years, you know, every time I walk into the classroom, I feel and I have that sense of responsibility, even though I know my students, it's a cohort, you know, program, but still, once you walk in, as she mentioned, you feel shy, it's not the shy, you yes, we blush, we, you know, it's a sense of responsibility, let's put it this way. Absolutely. And that's, part of the joy, right? We, exactly. we, take, our, we, take, our, we take our job seriously, that it Absolutely. is a responsibility and we want to do our best yeah. to, do, to do right by our students. So, I wanted to say something to uh, yes. uh, Karin's uh, comment that uh, I was also like terrified of losing the interaction in the Zoom, but, uh, and most of my students also, they don't uh, put themselves, you know, like they, I don't see them. But it's kind of interesting because I learned to recognize voices. I didn't even know that I will be able to, and I don't even think, and I say their name. It's like, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's really strange to me that I connect through voice so much. And, I, and, and the fact that I recognize their names when they answer, you know, and when we discuss is almost like it makes them feel comfortable, um, you know, that it's... It, even though we don't, I mean, they see me most of the time. And then when I turn on the, turn off the recording, you know, at the end for like, uh, and, and even periodically, I sometimes turn off the recording and say, okay, we can talk more freely now, you know, let, let's just, if anyone has any questions and then I'll continue the recording later. Uh, then sometimes they would actually show themselves. And in office hours, I usually ask if it's, if it's okay to show themselves because I'm not recording or anything. Mm -hmm. So then I kind of start connecting the picture, you know, the person to the voice. But yeah, it's interesting that we can even create familiarity just by voices. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm going to go ahead. I know we're getting short on time and I have so much more to cover and I probably I'm not I know I'm not going to get to all of it. I might just keep going since we're recording. And if you have to hop off at 220, feel free, but I'll just keep going so that I can record the remaining slides, if that's okay, Leslie. I think you're still here. So a couple of things, I have screenshots. So getting to know you survey, a lot of you probably do this already. I created on a Google slide and I asked my students questions at the beginning of each class, preferred pronouns. Um, is this your first time taking a class online? Are you are you caring for someone at home? Um, what is there anything specific you want me to know about you? What are things that make um, uh, a successful online 
class and what are some things that make a, a, a successful online professor. And so I use this information and I just offer it as extra credit, but I use this information and I, I give my students feedback and I say, hey, thank you for sharing this information. It's going to um, help me to better support you in the class. And they appreciate that. And it helps to foster engagement because they're feeling a connection, right? They're feeling like, you know, I'm trying to get to know them as an individual. Um, also in Canvas, one thing that I really, really like to do in my classes is this is giving students two perspectives of, of a discussion. So my discussions oftentimes, uh, oftentimes will ask them to read something. So in this case, a reading, um, a small a short essay and the video goes with the essay and then i'm asking them to write a response a reflection to the essay but then there's a blogger who wrote why i hate this essay so this blogger has a whole different perspective and i want students to respond to both did reading the other side change your original opinion about the initial essay so having students reflect on multiple perspectives of an issue is something that can help foster engagement. And then they also think there's not one right way to look at this perspective. Uh, I know this is really small, but this is a situation in a Canvas discussion where I give them choices. So there's not just one discussion prompt, I give them multiple discussion prompts. And so I say, choose one to respond and end the discussion. You can respond to any prompt, even if it's not your own. So it creates a richer discussion where we're not just all responding to the same discussion and you're hearing like iterations of the same responses, it keeps a richer um, discussion going and it also is able to cover more content. And so if a student didn't necessarily read about what question number three was about, they can read it through the dialogue that their classmates were having about that topic. So I like choice. Choice is a big motivator. Um, this is something that I do. Um, we have been talking a lot in, in for the past several months, I think, about trying to decolonize our curriculum. And so a lot of times our textbooks don't support that, right? Our textbooks are only giving one perspective. And so this is in our child development class, we have a theorist, Abraham Maslow, who is known to have coined our Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I didn't learn this until last year, and I've been in education for 25 years, that Maslow basically appropriated this from the uh, Blackfoot Indians. And so this is something that even though I'm sh sharing with my students, this is a theorist that you have to know, but I also want you to know that this was not his, his original idea. And in fact, he took the idea of the native people of Canada and he kind of flipped it, like literally flipped the icon up, upside down. And he's the person who's attributed with this theory. And so it's important for our students to know just because something's in your textbook, I encourage you to push back and challenge. And I want you to know that um, there are lots of different perspectives and sometimes the perspective that you're presented with is not always the most accurate one. Um, also, we want students to participate, right? Even though we know participation does not necessarily mean that they're engaged, but I give my students a participation rubric so that they know what, how are they going to be evaluated in their, par in their participation. So you can do this for online, um, synchronous, in person, and so they know what's expected. They know that participation is important. A couple more examples. I do a virtual lounge where students are, um, they, they can suggest songs that they want to hear on the playlist. And then this is just basically office hours. So office hours, I'll have music playing. Students can come and show up, drop in, ask questions, get to know each other. A lot of times students come just to listen to the music and they really appreciate that. It's a space for them to just kind of be, be together. Um, also, this is something from one of my colleagues at Harbor College embedded in her um, Canvas shell. After the first week, she wants their feedback. So she says, Leave me some overall thoughts and impressions. What worked well and what didn't work well in this week's learning? And it's on a Padlet, it's anonymous. The so students can feel safe to share their input. Flipgrid, it's a great video tool, especially when you're teaching online. I love Flipgrid. Students really like it too, especially in child development and education classes where they're supposed to practice teaching. So students are video recording themselves. Um, you can do it with discussion questions, my intro, um, my intro discussion, I always use Flipgrid so that students can get to see who's in their class and get to learn a little bit about them because all of the videos are compiled 
together and students can see each other's responses and they can respond to a student's video with another video response. And that's called Flipgrid. And then down here, oops, sorry, down here, another tool is Kahoot, which is another dynamic tool. Many of you may have seen it before. Students can use their smartphones to respond to questions. And then we use Jamboard in my class uh, to develop class norms at the beginning of class, and we can keep going back and revisit it. So this is where students tell me, and I pose the question, in order to do my best learning in this class, what I need is. And then that's how we develop our class norms. And again, because it's a Jamboard, we can see it all the time. We can go back, we can revisit it, we can change and modify as needed. And then um, here's a brief intro video, just so you like five seconds of it. Hi students, happy new year. And thank you so much for choosing my Child Development 44 course as you start the new year. I'm Dr. Smith and I'm gonna be your facilitator for this course. It is going to be quite an adventure. So you are embarking on a five week journey where you will learn lots about children with exceptionalities and how to support them and how to provide accommodations and modifications and to bring in parents as a support. Um, this class is very, very near and dear to my heart because I have an exceptional child at home. My seven year old son, Colson, who we lovingly refer to as Coco, is medically fragile due to an X linked genetic mutation. So you're going to get lots of love and authentic uh, passion from me from this course, and you'll learn a lot about our journey through the course. So the text. So that's just another example. So I know we're we're out of time. It's 221. So I'm just going to pause anyone who has any questions or comments and then I don't know if Leslie's here and I'm not looking at the chat at all let me see if I am able to keep going for anyone who wants to listen or has any thoughts or concerns I'm going to just keep going um, but as part of this official session are there any questions before we formally sign off if that makes sense Um, I have a comment. We need a class in how to become teachers. Well, I teach Can education one. Oh, <laughs> I teach education one introduction to teaching, but they have to do 45 hours of field work. So <laughs> thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just keep going. Those of you who can stay on. Awesome. I think I'll probably have about 10 more minutes of material, which probably means it's probably like 20 because I always underestimate, but I'm just going to keep going. Thank you. If you um, have to leave, I really appreciate your participation and your feedback. So this is something I have a few other examples in child development and in some of your classes, you might have uh, chapters that you find particularly boring. No, no better way to say it. So in our one of our foundations classes in child development, it's all about the theorists and it's boring. It's just one theorist after another, starting like in the 1700s, mostly white males. It's just not very engaging. And so what I do is I do something called a hot seat activities where the students are um, taking on the role of different theorists. They have time to prepare and then their classmates ask them questions. So it's almost like a talk show where they're pretending that they're Sigmund Freud or Eric Erickson or Lev Vygotsky and then students um, ask them questions. And this is a video, I won't show it. The video actually ironically is not that engaging, but um, it's another way for students to learn about these theories in a way that's gonna be memorable because participate like actively participating in something and emotion are other factors that engage students and increase their motivation. So by having students actually pretend that there are these different uh, theorists and then their classmates have to ask them questions, um, it actually you know, has some of those tenets of what makes students motivated. And that's you know, having choice because they're choosing their theorists, um, the emotion because they're because the emotion that they're feeling when they're portraying this particular person and because they're having an actual experience. Okay, something else that you can do, and I know it's not easy to do. This is something that I was doing when it was in person. You can do it virtually. So in my diversity class, we learned we learned about all different you know, differences in, in individuals. And so um, I had presenters come in. So these are presenters from the Blind Children's Center, which is the school where my son attended. So these are mobility specialists and they came in and they did a simulation activity with my students. 
um, taught them about Braille. You see on the back of the wall on the board, they talked about different um, disorders of the eye and how one can become visually impaired. Um, and so it was really, really great. So they did the simulation and the students really enjoyed it. She could let go and stop, right? But if I'm holding her and I'm pulling her, she doesn't have that power anymore. But I was okay. But you're okay, you're safe. And so back to my other point, my students in my online class, they also have to participate in a um, simulation for individuals with disabilities. And then I share with them a blog of someone who has a disability who says that simulations are not good. So we shouldn't do simulations and she gave her reasons why. And so I have my students kind of look at both sides and share their viewpoints. Any point, if she... um, this is another example in uh, one of my child development classes where I wanted to drive home a point about when children are developing their identity and we're talking about um, you know, their emotional well-being and we're talking about um, you know, how words can be hurtful. We had them, I'll show you. So we had them have cut out shapes and they had to tear up the shapes and they had to give those shapes insults. So they're imagining that they're somebody you know, a child or someone insulting another person. And so every time the person gave them an insult, they would rip off a piece, they would rip off a piece. And so ultimately I would say, okay, now put your person back together. Well, they're never the same, right? Even though you might be able to fit the puzzle pieces back together, you're gonna see the ridges, you're gonna see, you know, curled parts. And so that is an example. So it's hands on versus me telling them from the textbook, you know, I'm showing them, especially because in my field, you know, we're training future teachers. And so we want to demonstrate to them that when you're working with children, you need to give them something that's an experience, something that's hands on that will make sense for them to help drive that point. I should be hearing insults. <laughs> and the students were very, some of them were very reticent and shy and hesitant. They were like, I don't know. I don't know what to say. So I had to go around walking around saying insult. I want to hear those insults because they had a hard time doing it, but it was, it was fun. Um, and then this, our students did an equity trek, like a lot of us did as faculty for Spring Flex, which seems like forever ago, I want to say it was 2018, where students had to walk around campus, they had different questions that they had to ask, looking at it through the lens of a student. So what are we trying to find out for Jason Bourne? Uh, how long you can check out a book on reserve. All right, so let's head to the library to see if we can figure it out. So each group had, um, just like we did it as faculty, they had different um, students' intersectionality. So they had to try to find things on campus. So if they may, might be a student with a disability, a student who um, is first generation, a student who is a veteran, and they had to see how accessible the campus was, not just the physical terrain, but accessible services. Okay, so here is a list of best practices for engaging students. A lot of these we covered already. Um, and then if there are any other ideas that you wanna share, feel free. Anything else that you do that you wanna share? I was gonna have us put it on the Jamboard, but since we're out of time, we'll skip that part. I have one. Yes. Uh, I, you remember the video that I sent you about the animals, the teacher that bring animals out and, you know, so I, I kind of use that in my class, you know, and I love to have live animals or bring, you know, like plants or take the students out for even a short field trip on the, in, in the campus really, um, you know, it's like what, for you, what you did with the cutting, you know, it's it just, you see it right there, what you're talking about. So um, I, I feel like in biology, that's kind of what we do. We, we just have to have access to live material. And that's why it's so important for us, for example, to get the, eventually the um, greenhouse and, you know, to have the garden area and to have like this diversity of plants that we have around the MSA building and, you know, other things. It's just very important. And, and to have live animals. That's why I was coming every Friday 
to the campus during the pandemic so we can wow. keep it alive. Wow. Thank you for doing that. That's amazing. It's such a valuable and rich experience for our students. So thank you for hanging on. So um, something else that I was going to share, and I'm just going to go through it quickly, is that we're talking about student engagement in our classroom, but I wanted us to think about it in a broader context like across the campus because we have very diverse student groups. And then this quote to me really, really stood out. A review of the robust student engagement literature would suggest that the students are white, they are engaging in opportunities afforded primarily to white affluent students, their engagement is occurring on predominantly white campuses in predominantly white spaces with other white people. So we have to kind of keep in mind when we talk about um, engagement, right? So these authors are seeking to shift uh, the dominant narrative associated with student engagement because our students are dynamic. There are external and internal forces that are shaping them based on the context, based on what groups they are part of. So think intersectionality. So engagement is not a one size fits all approach. So I provide students with questions before listening or reading, provide them with focused questions so that they know what are they supposed to be thinking about as you're going through this. I always try to set a purpose for reading. So what are you gonna be thinking about? What are some ideas that resonate with you? What are some areas that we're doing well, that we're approaching? What are some areas that we still are, are developing? And then what is an area that you, you plan to focus on this semester? So I have, and I can share this uh, PowerPoint with anyone who's interested. Um, engaging students of color is one that I, I pulled a few from the book. And so students of color is one that I focused on. Um, students with disabilities. So how do we engage these particular groups? Um, this is an example of universal design, which one of the students mentioned in the panel this morning. If any of you were at that session, she talked about universal design. And universal design basically says, we want to um, create an environment that is going to, whether you are you have a disability or not, it's going to benefit everyone. Um, we focus on queer students. What are some ways to engage our, our queer students and first generation students? This book, um, which is one of the ones that I showed you in the beginning, it's co-authored by Sean Harper, who, um, if any of you did any of the USCE convenings, he was the one who was facil facilitating. This is such a great book. It covers all of these student groups, undocumented, student parents, student athletes, indigenous, transgender, student activists. So there's all these groups and there's a whole chapter for each group on how do we engage these particular students. So it's really phenomenal. I highly encourage you to check it out if you can. Um, maybe we can delve into this um, through professional development. I'll, I'll pose it to Leslie. And then I end with the same questions. Um, you know, what are some areas that you plan to focus on this semester? And then final thoughts. Foster relationship and build community. Remember that students are dynamic. They come from various contexts. Think intersectionality. Consider adult learning theory. Use technology and other sources. Provide choice promote autonomy and welcome student input and feedback, use prior knowledge to build new knowledge, think outside of the box, and then connect to real world and hands-on experiences. And that is it. <laughs> so I appreciate you staying yeah, on well done. Longer. I appreciate it so much. Of course, just like in my classes, I over plan and I don't get to cover everything, which is something I have to work on. <laughs> we all have that problem. <laughs> well, that was awesome, Marini. That was really, really good. And thank I'm, you so I'm much. Thankful. You're very welcome. Absolutely. This was really, really. I, I really feel like, you know, the thing is, this, none of us really had teacher training. I mean, we have our experiences and we've been.